I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Kimberly has been working very hard to prepare for this. Uh, this is going to be some of the best work you've ever seen her do. I'm so excited about this webinar. Um, and a lot of time and thoughts gone in. I've been there to watch it. And this is a culmination of what literally amounts to months of work. So I want to start just by saying thank you, Kimberly, for the time, the effort, the dedication you put into this and to educating all of us. So how's that for an introduction? That's pretty good. Thank you. We're ready to get rolling. I'm going to get out of your way because we have good stuff to cover. So let's get into it. Okay, welcome everyone. If um, if you are attending this webinar, I'm assuming that you probably watched part one um, back in September. And this is a culmination of information. Part one was a general overview on how to use the divergent channels and understand them within AccuGraph. And then one of the treatment strategies within AccuGraph um, to treat the divergent channels was using ion pumping cords. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk very specifically about ion pumping cords and how to incorporate them into your practice. So um, I do also want to say that today's webinar is an advanced course. So it is assumed that you already have a really good general practice of um, a general understanding of acupuncture, that you're well-trained in acupuncture, that you're well-trained in AccuGraph. And at this point, you're wanting to expand your treatment strategies and expand your knowledge. And so um, a lot of what I'm going to teach you is on a more advanced level. So I hope that you're excited about that. Many practitioners have been asking for more advanced stuff. Let's see, I'm going to. So since the last webinar, there have been two blog posts that have gone out. One of them um, was a webinar follow, patients are getting better faster. And then there were some studies on ion pumping cords. In the webinar follow-up, um, you learned I talked about my my approaches to treatment and how the divergent treatment and tendinal muscular treatments is something that I combine together. And so the divergent treatment that I use with the ion pumping cords is more of a root treatment. And the musculoskeletal portion of what I do is more of a branch. And in, so today's webinar is very specific to the the ion pumping cord portion of that treatment. Before I get into all of the nuts and bolts on a clinical point of view, I am going to turn the time over to Dr. Larson and he's going to talk science. Um, he's going to tell you why ion pumping cords work, um, how they work, what the science is behind them. and he'll talk at a whole level that is well beyond my head. I just get really excited because I'm using them and I get really great results. And so I'll talk, I'll come back to that in a moment, but for right now, let's turn it over to Dr. Larson. All righty, I guess my break's over already, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so regarding the science behind ion pumping cords, see if we can get that to go. We really have to thank Dr. Yoshio Manaka uh, medical doctor in Japan, PhD in biology, uh, and an excellent, very accomplished acupuncturist and researcher. This is a guy who devoted his life to um, not only treating patients, but to researching what works, why it works, and researching even some of the ancient um, relationships in acupuncture. Uh, the, all of the things that we've been taught so we're all taught in school that, oh, the meridians work this way, and this is where the channels are, and this is where the points are, and, and these two meridians are connected together philosophically because they share the same element, etc. Well, he went through and verified a lot of those relationships, the direction of energy flow. Uh, so a tremendous scientist and a brilliant man. He was a student of Akabane, and you may recall Akabane developed or pioneered the method of measuring meridians by taking a uh, burning moxapunk and stroking it on the Jingwell points and counting the strokes until the patient felt the heat and using that to diagnose the chi level in each channel. 
So Dr. Menaka was thinking in terms of channel, thinking in terms of chi, and he developed the use of ion pumping cords specifically so that you could take an area where there's too much chi and move that chi to an area where there's not enough, kind of a one-way sort of a thing. The way that he uh, originally developed these was during uh, the war, uh, during World War II, experiences treating burn victims. He confirmed the unidirectional aspect of meridian flow and that by hooking up with a burn victim, they would put a uh, foil, aluminum foil and gauze over a burn. And then they would connect uh, a wire to that and connect another wire somewhere else and create an ionic gradient. And an ion simply means charged particle. So you'd have a positive charge, a negative charge. And by creating a flow in one direction, they were healing burns very quickly and found that with ion pumping cords, you could achieve a profound treatment and shift for the patient in about 10 minutes. So what is an ion pumping cord? Why does it work? What's the science behind it? It's really a simple device, actually. In order to make sure that electricity can flow one direction but not flow the other direction, you have a one-way valve in there. In this case, it's an electronic component called a diode. And diodes, they have an anode and a cathode, a positive and a negative side, and electricity will only flow in one direction from the anode to the cathode. Now, the way that happens is that a diode is made of a semiconductor. Normally, you would use silicon as a semiconductor because uh, it works well, it has a unidirectional flow. That's why all of our computers are based on silicon chips. It's because it is a semiconductor and because it has directional current flow. That's how you can make computational processing even possible. So a diode, pretty simple. Uh, essentially, you have a, a chunk of silicon. You have it um, arranged in the right direction or oriented in the right direction, so the current only flows one way. But here's the problem. As you flow from the anode to the cathode, the amount of electricity getting through drops because although it lets it flow, it restricts it somewhat. And so you lose voltage. In electronics, this is called a voltage drop. And the voltage drop going through that diode is fine in most electrical applications, but it's not so good when you're dealing with the very tiny biological currents that are created in the body. You don't want to be restricting that any more than you absolutely have to because it's already so small to begin with. And so you have to use not silicon, but a very specialized element, you have to use germanium, and it has to be extraordinarily pure germanium. Um, like you have to, they call it five nines pure, 99.999% pure germanium, even six nines pure, in order to get the diode to work properly. And so when you have a germanium diode, they do. They have all of the advantages of a silicon diode, meaning one-way current flow, and it won't let it flow back. But it also has very low voltage drop, so almost all the current gets through when you have a high-quality, pure germanium diode. And so to make an ion pumping cord that works, that's what you have to use. And it's kind of a specialized thing. It's not something that you can really make yourself very well. Believe me, I looked into it. That's the kind of guy I am. I tried. Um, but what we found was the ones that are supplied that we can buy uh, from Japan that have the correct diode in them um, and that were originally designed by Monaco, they're the best on the market. And particularly because they also have the gripping clips that you're going to see. So that's the science about how it works. And when you look at an ion pumping cord, there's that little black section in the middle. That's where the diode is. And that's what makes sure that the energy only flows one direction. So with that, Kimberly, I think we are up to your video. Do you want me to go ahead and play your video now? I have a question. Yeah. Um, one of the things that people often want to know about um, this on the science end of the ion pumping cords is the test testing it to make sure that it's working. Uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about the device that's used to test it? Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, you know what I should do is during the video, I'll grab uh, a tester and I'll just do a quick testing demo on video. How about that? That'd be perfect. 
Okay, so I'll demonstrate that after the video. And right now, are we ready to start your demo video? Um, and yeah, let me just give a little introduction to it. Go ahead. So um, for this demo video, when you are using ion pumping cords, I am teaching you how I use them in relation to um, the the divergent treatment with an AccuGraph. So I am teaching you my, th I'm walking you through my thought process. I am walking you through a patient protocol and I'm helping you recognize how to choose which points and then going through the process. So this is sort of what you wanna catch from this video is the nuts and bolts, how to clip it on, how to use them, how to think when you're using them. So we'll walk you through this point next and we'll go ahead and start with the video. Okay, I am here today to teach you about ion pumping cords. We've had a lot of questions and I thought that if I did a demo for you that you would be able to see how they work. What you need to do first is, um, your first step is to graph your patient. And after you've graphed your patient, you can add points to the treatment plan. The way we're doing that today is if you notice in the far right corner, um, of your treatment strategies. If you click on the divergent channel treatment, um, all of the points at the bottom will be added to the treatment plan and you will see them in on your screen. So in a previous webinar, we've talked about understanding the differences between the different sections of the divergent channel treatment. Basically, there's three styles of treatment within um, the entire treatment plan. I've differentiated them on your screen in yellow. So the top four points in this treatment strategy are extraordinary vessels. The next four points are divergent points and the last four um, have to do with left-right imbalances and they are back shoe points on the body. What you'll want to do after you have um, well, let's go back a second. When you're deciding which points to treat, you've got multiple options within those three strategies. You could treat all of them if you wished. You'd have to do a front treatment and a back treatment. Or um, the example treatment that I'm going to talk about today is just using the front treatment. So if the computer screen were in front of me, I would delete the bottom four points on the urinary bladder channel and move on so that just the top eight points were showing. So um, when you're doing treatment, you will treat as you normally would. I am going to grab needles. Um, and it's, it's fairly simple. You are going to follow um, what you were told on the screen. So I am going to do stomach 40 on the left. If you'll notice, I'm using a metal needle. You could use sarins with a plastic um, with a plastic end, but um, and I may be using those further in the treatment. But when you're using the ion pumping cords, you want to be able to hook metal to metal, so the clip needs to go onto metal. So I did stomach 40 on the left. I'm going to do large intestine five on the right. And the needles don't have to go extremely deep, just similar to how you would um, use them if you weren't using ion pumping cords. The next point I'm going to do is small intestine three on the left. And then I'm gonna do bladder 62 on the right. Is there anything magic to that order, Kimberly, or can you do them? Can you insert the needles in any order as long as you get them all in? You can do them in any order. I tend to get uh, can, not confused, but it's easier for me to start from the top and work to the bottom so that I'm right down the staying list. with my left and my right because this is a little different than my normal strategy or my. Sure. This is my normal strategy, but it I do have to think a little bit on which side. So next, I am going to do spleen nine on the left. And I'm going to, the, within the typical divergent channel 
um, strategies through Mikishima, stomach one is the divergent point. We won't be needling stomach one, we'll be needling stomach two. So um, I'm going to needle stomach two on the left. And when I am doing the face points, I actually like to use a sarin needle. So the type of sarin that I use for treatment um, when I'm doing the face, it's type J. So it's a really, really thin needle and it, um, the patient doesn't feel any pain. It's, it's very on the left. On the left. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we are going to do. We're going to do that on the left and um, next I'm going to do bladder 40 on the right. Bladder 40 is um, under the knee and when the patient is lying in this position, it's not hard to do. You just have to um, adjust slightly to where the needle is. And then when the patient relaxes, the needle is sticking out. So when you hook the cord to that needle, it's, it's not a problem to have the connection that you need. Let's see, and then finally my last point, again, I'm going to jump back to a serin needle because I'm working on the face. And this, um, this needle will be bladder, the suggested treatment point is bladder one. I'm going to use bladder two. Bladder one would actually be right here next to the eye and I am more comfortable with treating bladder two. So I am going to do that. So the next thing I do after I have inserted the needles before I put the wires on, the points on the face, when you clip a wire to them, they, they could fall out easily, and especially with the really tiny sarins. So I use tape. Um, it looks like this. It is the, I forget exactly what it's called, but uh, they call it micropore and it is loss that sells it. And so I take this tiny bit of tape and I tape down the needle. And then when I hook the wire onto it, it stays nicely. I don't, I don't, um, I don't tape all of the needles in the body. I just tape the sarins on the face. So we are going to tape this one as well. And I just turn the needle a little bit and add, does that hurt at all? No, I can't feel anything. Perfect. So the next step is the ion pumping cord. So we have treated, we put the needle in the eight points and the next thing you need to know about ion pumping cords. Ion pumping cords are um, delicate in nature, so you wanna take care of them. In, you'll notice that in my clinic, I've got little hooks right here on a cabinet. Uh, I think if there were hooks here on the wall that I would have them hanging individually and I would grab each one. Today you're watching me and I've got them hanging around to my neck. Um, problem with hanging around my neck, sometimes they get a little bit uh, discombobulated. So give me one second. There we go. Okay, so then it's really easy after that. Um, you have chosen your left and right side that you've put your needles on, and now what you're going to recognize, if the point is red um, in your treatment plan, you're going to clip the red clip on the needle, and if the point is marked blue, you're going to use the black needle. So for stomach 40 and large intestine 5, those two go together, I will clip the left, uh, red on large intestine 5, and this clip, when you, um, when you pinch them, notice when you look at the clip, they're open. When you pinch it together, that is when it creates the, um, the claw that's able to grab the wire. And then when you let go, then it hooks onto the wire. So I will uh, show you how that's done right here. So I'm going to pinch it to create the claw then I'm going to grab the needle and then it holds on. So that is large intestine five. And then I'm gonna take the black to stomach 40. 
And Kimberly, does it matter if you clip the needle shaft or the needle handle as long as they're both metal? As long as they're both metal, it doesn't matter. Um, I tend to do the shaft a little bit closer to the skin so it doesn't have as much pull on yeah, the needle. Yeah, it's not going to bend over. So it's not going to bend over. Okay. Um, so it, it depends on your preference. That seems to be mine as long as the needle is in um, deep enough so that it's not going to pull it out. That's something you have to, you don't have to go really deep, but you just have to be cautious. Okay, next we're going to do small intestine 3 and bladder 62. So small intestine 3 is blue, so I am going to put the black on small intestine 3, and I'm going to clip the red on bladder 62. And something you were, you were talking to me about a little earlier is, you know, the, you'll have several cords here and you said it's important to make sure they don't get tangled or hang off the table because then they're pulling on a needle. So kind of yeah. pay attention to your cords. So recognize here, I, I've got them just sort of draped on her body. If I was, if I was careless and I just let this fall over to the side, then there's going to be more pull on the needle and it can pull out. So patients don't even recognize that they're hooked to these needles. It's very relaxing and it just sits in that way. So I'm just a little bit careful in how I drape the needles over the center of the body. All right, let me move on here. Spleen nine is going to be the black clip and stomach one is going to be the red. All right, so that just clipped really nicely and easily onto her face. And then um, for the next two needles, I'm going to do the black on bladder 40. And remember, I left just a little bit sticking out here so I could get it. On this one, I went ahead and clipped it onto um, the handle instead of the shaft because it was easier for me to gain access. And then finally, I'm going to do the red here um there so essentially this is your root treatment and this is enough perfect to balance the graph so once all of the needles are hooked up in 10 minutes of time this com treatment is completely done it won't matter if you leave the needles longer but 10 minutes is is what's needed in order to complete the treatment uh, another common question let's see let me move on so here's things that you want to remember. You want to make sure you get your black and your red correct. So if in your treatment plan, the point is blue, you'll put a black clip on. If the point is red, you will put a red clip on. You want to be careful of tangles and then careful of too much tension on the wires. This is very comfortable for the patient to lay um, the way we have her laying. And I showed you how the clips work and we talked about where to clip. Um, bladder one and stomach one, if Acugraph recommends bladder one or stomach one, I always go to the next point on the channel if I am treating with needles. And um, the 10 minutes. The other question that I get is, if, if this is balancing the graph, what if the patient also has a headache or the patient also has digestive issues or whatever their chief nausea that day, whatever their chief complaint is. I can add more needles at this point um, to add to the treatment and, and keep them here for even within that 10 minutes and the treatment will be done. So this is the route and you can still add um, treatment for the branch if I was gonna do auricular therapy or anything else. And then if you left the patient for longer than 10 minutes because you were busy in the other room, it wouldn't hurt them. They would just continue to be relaxed when you're done. So um, I am going to, we're gonna move on to the next example. And do you wanna help me pull needles real fast? Mm -hmm. And in this next example that we're going to talk about, when you're pulling the needles, sometimes I actually use the clip to pull the needle completely, and then you can grasp the needle accordingly, like so. It's actually faster and easier to do it that way. Um, on the face, the tape comes off. Very easy. Sometimes I'll even use the tape to hold the needles together. Okay. 
Perfect. Then when you are done and you have unhooked all of your uh, needles, then it can, you want, again, you want to carefully take your ion pumping cords and keep them so that they are not tangled. I'll put a couple around my neck because we're going to do another example. Alrighty. The next example that I'm going to do, I won't be doing the full graph, but I'm going to walk you through. So again, in this example, you would graph the patient. And here we have a very messy graph. And you would put the divergent points into the treatment. Bed. And again, we have extraordinary divergent and left right. If you'll notice something different about this particular graph, there are only three extraordinary points listed. And there's a reason for that. Um, I'll go back and look. Notice how high the kidney channel is on that graph. It is extremely high. There's a lot of extra energy in the kidney channel. So if you go and look onto the extraordinary treatment, lung seven and heart five, which are very deficient, we'll go back and look. Notice how the lung and heart are so deficient. They're going to pull energy from that kidney channel. So in this treatment strategy, um, we'll, we'll decide which to treat. Again, I'm going to use extraordinary and divergent. I'm going to pull the, um, the back shoe points off of my treatment plan. And now we come to a total of seven treatment points. So on our last example, we had, we had eight points. This one, we have seven. So I am, I'm not going to um, hook her up for the Sanjiao 10, gallbladder 12, bladder 40, or bladder one. I'm going to hook her up for the three top points, kidney six, lung seven, and heart five. And this is, um, this is how you will, how you will do this. You're still going to use two wires. So I am going to do kidney six on the left. And I am going to do lung seven on the right. I'm going to do heart five on the right. And then of course I would do the other four points as well and we would do it the same way that we did it last time. But the way that you would do wires to lung seven, heart five, and kidney six is like so. You are going to take your black wire number one, you're going to take your black clip and you're going to clip it on kidney six. Again, I'm gonna go right here close to the shaft on this one. Um, and it looks like so. And then I'm going to take the red and I'm gonna come up to lung seven. Then I'm going to take the black on my second wire and I'm gonna go back to kidney six. So what you're going to recognize here is that there are going to be two clips on kidney six and I will just go right next to it. Um, there's plenty of room, um, especially if you're using an all silver needle um, or stainless steel. You just want to, you wouldn't want to put these two clips way on the end of the needle because it would be too heavy. So you just keep them closer to her body. And then I am going to clip heart five as so. And then of course I would do Sanjiao 10 and gallbladder 12 um, connected, and I would do bladder 40 and bladder one connected, and then I would leave the patient sit for 10 minutes. So the take home message for our second treatment um, is that if you only see three extraordinary points, you'll still use two wires and you will hook two leads up to the same needle. And then the other thing is, recognize that in AccuGraph, there are more than the eight extraordinary um, vessel points. There are 12 of them. And we've talked about that in a previous webinar. So we, I've listed them all here. So the new ones, the new master points are large intestine five, stomach 40, 
um, liver four and heart five. So that is the basics on ion pumping cords. And I think you're going to feel confident to move forward and begin treating with them. All right, Kimberly, you back? I am back. So before I, there's a lot of questions and I have a lot of answers, of course, before I jump into the questions, do you want to do that um, little segment you were going to do about the ion pumping cords? Yeah. Yeah. Let me talk uh, about how to test your ion pumping cords, make okay. sure that they're working correctly. So uh, here I have my ion pumping cord. I'm going to try to get up close. This is what Kimberly was talking about with those clips, because when I squeeze the clip here, you can see it makes a little claw like that. And so by squeezing it together, that is where you grasp the needle, just like that. Okay, so I've got the black and I've got the red. And this is an ion pumping cord tester. As you can see, it's got a spot for batteries. You can put a nine volt battery on it like I have, or you can use uh, AA batteries, either or. You don't have to put both in. As long as there's one set or the other on there, you're good. On the other side, you see it's got two test points and a red LED. And so here's how this works. Let's see if I can hold this up to the camera here and make it work if I have enough hands. I'm going to take the red and I'm going to clip it on there. And when I touch the black, whoops, darn it. These are too big for the clips to hold on to very well. Normally I just touch them, but normally I'm not trying to hold them up for the video. Okay, when I touch the black... You see the light turn on. Now, if I switch those, if I hook the red onto the black side, so it's backwards, and I touch the black, the light will not turn on. So what that verified, that verified two things by that test. First of all, it showed me that the cord is working, meaning it will turn the light on. Electricity will flow. And that's important because you have no way of knowing that electricity is flowing unless you actually test the cord. Because when you put it on a patient, you just clip it on and, and you hope that it's working. But if maybe your cord got damaged, maybe you yanked it too hard and broke something, I don't know. It's a good way to, to know that it's working. Secondly, you know that it only flows in one direction. So you know that diode is working. Because when I touch it one way, it lights. Touch it the other way, it does not. So testing your cords you know, every month or so, just to make sure that everything's working well, is a great idea. The testers are not expensive. They're like 19 bucks. And um, having a tester around keeps all your ion pumping cords in good working order. So there you go. Did that cover it for you, Kimberly? That did. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Cameron and our whole crew. I should show you guys some of the funny pictures of us in my treatment room doing that video, but we had a good time creating it. I hope that it was helpful and that you learn from it. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to a question that Mary answered. She says, I found an ion pumping cord in a back drawer. It has a black alligator clip on one end with two wires coming out of it, going to a red and a green clip. That is not an ion pumping cord. It, it, that, maybe Adrian knows what type of a cord that might be, but an ion company pumping cord definitely has the diode in the middle and it has a red clip and a black clip and that's how they work. Sometimes the clips, um, I have, I have a different type of clip that has a larger clip on it that doesn't have the little claw like Adrian showed. I have used those in my clinic as well, but I don't like them. They're too heavy. They pull the needles out. Inevitably, when I come back in the room, the heaviness of the big clip has pulled the needles out um, of my patients. So I really like, even though the little claw clip is awkward to figure out at first, once you figure it out, it works the best because of the size and especially if you're doing multiple clips on one needle. Do you have anything to add to that, Adrian? No, you absolutely covered it. That's not an ion pumping cord, whatever it is. It must be for something else. Yeah, I got a lot of weird cords in drawers that I don't know what they are, but I do know what an ion pumping cord is. So that is not an ion pumping cord. Okay, Robin asks, when do you use eight extraordinary points and divergent points versus just the eight extraordinary points? 
So she says, I find it strange to put ion pumping cords on the face like stomach two and bladder two. So you will find, and, and as I go into the rest of the presentation, I'm going to show some um, examples of when I would use each. I, if I have a patient who has a, a really, really messy graph, and typically this is a brand new patient, I'm just beginning the treatment process, the graph is just really extreme, then I will use both the divergent and the extraordinary points. Um, if within a treatment series, things the patient is beginning to get better and we're getting more to um, just their basic um, imbalances, we've taken off a lot of layers, then I'm just working with extraordinary and um, and chief complaint symptoms. And oftentimes if I have a patient who maybe they're a wellness patient and I'm not, they don't have the great extremes going on, but they do have pretty much a messy graph. I will, tr I will work with the extraordinary treatments at that point. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, I'm going to answer the bladder one or the stomach and the bladder in just a second. She says, when you tape the face, this is Robin again. When you tape the face, is the tape on the handle or the shaft of the needle? It was hard to tell in the video. So I'm actually taping it onto the handle and then I am hooking onto the shaft. And then Catherine asks, are all sets of iron pumping cords across the body? They are not. Sometimes you will um, acugraph takes based off of the measurements that it's done within all of the channels. And so it depends on left and right imbalances. Sometimes I'm hooking up um, needles that are just on the left side of the body or the right side of the body. So it just depends on the graph. So don't be concerned if some one time it's cross and one time it's not, it's totally normal to be different. Uh, next question, could you just tape the ion pumping cords onto the points instead of using needles? I'm thinking for pediatric treatment. Um, you, I have heard of that strategy. I think if it were me, if I were doing that strategy, I would use red and blue lasers instead. So I would treat the point with lasers. If you have an older pediatric child and you needed to do, let's say the divergent and the extraordinary treatment, if, if the patient will allow you to, um, you know, to do the four needles and put the cords on them, I maybe with a child would tape the ones to the body just because they're a little bit wiggly, but then I would possibly do the divergent treatment portion of it with laser and use the blue and red laser. So that's my thought process on that. Um, looks like I have a couple more. So AccuGraph tells you when to cross or not to cross. Yes. When you, it'll, it tells you if it's a left or a right. So if one of your, point combinations, one's on the left and one's on the right, then you're crossing. If both points that you're hooking together are on the right, then you're not crossing. So it's just a matter of where I get those needles. All righty, if there aren't any more questions right now, specifically about the webinar, I do have more information to show. So let me get back to my- You want me to restart the slide presentation, Kimberly? Please, that would be fantastic. All righty, so I think you are on this slide. Yes. So Dr. Larson talked all kinds of amazing science and I am always so grateful for his scientific mind. And for me, it's a matter of what is happening in my clinic, what I am seeing, feeling, experience, what the experience is with the patient. And so my analysis of, Let's see, I feel like my face has to be showing as I'm describing this. My perspective of the divergent treatment is when you are treating the body and you have this really difficult patient and you know that if you put a needle in here in, in one in the leg and you put another needle in the arm that you're supposed to be able to move energy in each of those channels and it's supposed to come together someplace in the middle of the body and in 24 to 48 hours everything begins to balance or at least that's the hope um but it depends on um 
of course, it depends on how much is going on on the internal aspects and digestion and how much phlegm damp and how much blood stagnation. There's always so many aspects to what is happening. I feel like the divergent channel treatment is this, like I'm a, like I'm a warrior with this well-defined strategy. If I put a needle here and I put another needle here, and instead of trying to make sure everything's gonna come together in the middle, I'm, I'm the one in control saying, I'm gonna pull energy from this channel. I'm going to send it to the wire. I'm going to strengthen this other channel where it's weak. And now that I've made those two channels strong that I know that everything can come together in the middle and because they are divergent points, I know absolutely that it's reaching the middle. So I get, I get a much stronger treatment strategy um, in that thought process. And I don't use divergent, I don't use ion pumping cords and divergent treatment on every single one of my patients, but there are certain ones where it's just tough and sticky and icky and flammy and cruddy and I, it, it just helps me to get the job done faster. Um, I, when my patients ask me about this, I kind of call it my Robin Hood theory. I said, yeah, this channel has too much and this has too little. And I'm just going to steal, steal from the rich and give to the poor and um, balance everything out. So this is my non-scientific analysis of ion pumping cords, but it's really what it feels like is happening in the treatment to me. And then the patient perspective, my patients are always asking me, Kimberly, what new thing are you doing? They know that they're, they're guinea pigs in my clinic and they're always excited when I have something new to share and teach. And so their perspective, they say that when they're laying on the table, it's like a pinball game. You know, if you were to pull the, pull the, the lever and the ball goes in and it just begins to move and go ping, 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 boop, 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 goes all over the place. <laughs> you like my analysis there? Anyway, um, when the ball moves all throughout the body, that is what they're experiencing when they're laying on the table because we have created such a powerful treatment from the two channels that we need to strengthen. Then within, they just feel all this movement going on. And then others will describe it like an out of body experience. Just, I've had patients tell me they feel like their body just floated out of, they floated out of their body and they were so relaxed and they were sleeping and they were drooling. So that's the patient perspective. I'm gonna be done with my non-scientific analysis here and we'll move on to the graphs. <laughs> Let's see. So ion pumping cords. They're obviously a new strategy. I do not use them for every patient that I treat. I'm teaching you what I know and understand about them at this point. I'm sure that will expand and change. But what I do want you to know right now is that the black clip pulls energy out of a channel that has excess energy. So it sedates the channel. The red, the red clip tonifies, it puts energy back into a channel. So if you're using two clips, you can know that one channel has too much, one channel has too little, and by pulling energy out with a black clip and then putting energy back in with the red clip, that's what science is doing. You'll need four wires for each treatment room. And I suggest that you find something to hang them on. I, clips, I think some clips on the wall where you just hang them over a clip would be really nice because then you're not dealing with messy wires each time. Um, I would like to give a little disclaimer here. You never want to use a combined strategies of microcurrent while using ion pumping cords. One practitioner, and I won't share her name on here, shared with me in the very beginning when I started talking about these, she said, oh, Kimberly, tell your people never to use microcurrent with ion pumping cords because it's really bad. You will damage, you will ruin the ion pumping cords um, because you're adding electricity to them. So don't do that. And um, recognize that the full effective treatment takes about 10 minutes. Doesn't mean that I won't leave my patient longer, but it's nice to know that in that first 10 minutes, their body has gone into balance. I like to leave the patient in the room with under a heat lamp and as cozy and comfortable as possible. And Dr. Larson, did you have a comment? Oh, I was just gonna say, 
Uh, we we get asked. I, we were at PCOM this last weekend, and I had folks coming up to the booth saying, "I love what Kimberly's teaching about ion pumping cords. I wish I knew where to buy some." Um, and I'm like, "What? We didn't we didn't make it clear that we actually offer these things for sale? Apparently, we didn't." Uh, and so people were like searching the internet, whatever. Uh, so I'm putting up right now um, just a link where people can go. Uh, to, to pick them up. Um, we're not here trying to sell you a bunch of stuff. We're just providing the resource so that you can do the treatment and so that you can use your AccuGraph to its full potential. But here they are. This link will show you where you can get the, the cords, the testers, and um, we'll leave that up for a few minutes. And then also we will have a, a handout that Kimberly's prepared. I'll put that up in a few minutes. Back to you, Kimberly. Thank you. All righty. So, I have recognized that I can use ion, now mind you, this webinar is specifically about ion pumping cords. So I've recognized that I can use ion pumping cords as a root treatment and also a branch treatment. If I'm using an ion pumping cord as a root treatment, my full purpose is to balance the graph. Um, that's always my purpose in a root treatment in regardless of what I'm doing, even if I was doing an advanced treatment or if I was doing an ear treatment, whatever, I always come up with a treatment to balance the graph. So that is um, the main concept of what I've taught you so far um, based on the divergent channels. I'm going to expand upon that a little and give you some other thought processes. Um, so in my experience, a root treatment is not enough to get a really successful treatment. If you put the body into balance, then move on and do whatever treatment you're going to do with the branch treatment, you will get better results. And so I wanna make that really clear. And in today's webinar, I'm not going to teach you all kinds of amazing branch treatments because I've been teaching those all along the way. I am going to, in this webinar, give you a couple of ideas on how to use ion pumping cords as a root treatment. And then I'm going to give a couple ideas of how to use ion pumping cords as a branch treatment. And then I might typically my branch treatment does not include ion pumping cords. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of ways that you could use ion pumping cords for a branch treatment. And if I was using them for a branch treatment, I would probably choose a different method for my root treatment. I might treat the ear as my root treatment and then use my ion pumping cords as a branch treatment. And then make sure that you also recognize that you don't, this isn't expanding your treatment time going, oh, now I have to do that ion pumping cord treatment and then wait 10 minutes and then come back and do a branch treatment. It's not that at all. Hook up your wires for an ion pumping, pumping cord root treatment, and then immediately put in whatever needles you want to for a branch treatment. So I just want to be clear about that. All right, onward. So your basic treatment, root treatment for balancing the graph is the divergent treatment. We talked a lot about that and why it works and how it works in the last webinar. But just as a reminder, click on the divergent channel um, treatment box, the points will come up, add those points to your treatment plan, and they're all there. The next thing that you want to recognize, the, the yellow, the green, and the red that you see right here, that's not going to show up on your screen. I've just put highlights here so that you recognize the difference. The top points are the extraordinary points, the bottom points are the divergent points, or the middle are divergent, and the bottom are left right. You have choices at this point. You could pick and choose. If you want to do a full root treatment and and just you could do um, the extraordinary and divergent on the front and then you could turn the patient over and also do the left right on the back and call it done um, That would and add some muscular points that you could do all of that. I don't typically add the back points to the extraordinary and divergent. If my patient needed to be face down, I might only choose the left right on the back. If my patient was face up, I might choose the extraordinary and divergent. If the graph is really, really messy, I would do extraordinary and divergent. If I'm further along in a treatment process and we're now beginning to unravel um, portions of what's going on, I might drop the divergent treatment and just do the extraordinary. And 
I would choose extraordinary just like I would have chosen extraordinary any time before. So know that always those the first points listed, it'll either be three or four, and you need to know the difference between um, what extraordinary points are. Sometimes I will use um, just extraordinary, and, and that will be my route of balancing the graph, and then I will move on. Yes? <laughs> hey, I wanted to put up your handout. This seems like a good time. You've uh, you prepared this nice PDF for everybody, so I just put up the link over there where you can download that, folks. Okay. You're awesome. Thank you. All right. So here is another way. So here's a patient. Obviously, it um, her graph is not um, it's not really super messy. It wouldn't be the typical time that I would choose to do a a divergent treatment or an extraordinary treatment. But notice that on if I'm clicking on element, the spleen is deficient and the stomach is excess. I could, now Accugraph isn't going to tell you how to do this. This is just me thinking in an advanced way, but I could put the black clip on a stomach point because I want to sedate that channel. And I could put the red clip on a blue point because I want to tonify it. And I know the next question would be, Kimberly, well, what points would you use? Well, if I'm trying to balance out the spleen and stomach, I might be doing spleen six and stomach 36. Um, I might be using the tonification and sedation points. You, you could simply use what Accugraph recommends as the tonification and sedation points, but you could also use base spleen and stomach and work accordingly. So that is another way that you can use your ion pumping cords. I would think about this if this patient typically has major digestive issues, if I'm not getting good results in regular graphing so I'm, or regular treatment, I might want to make that my results a little more powerful and use the ion pumping cords. I'm gonna give another example within the element. Um, here is the lung and the large intestine one is deficient and one is excess, and then the spleen is excess and the stomach is excess. Those seem to be the major graph imbalances um, for this patient. So I can simply use, um, I could use the points recommended by the tonification and sedation points, but this patient, uh, this patient actually came in for a headache and these were the imbalances that I saw in the graph. So to, to balance the graph, I worked with a spleen six and a stomach 36. And then um, I also knew that she was coming down with a cold. And so I used a lung seven and an LI four. So I simply just used the, use the ability of the ion pumping cord to pull the excess from the large intestine channel and feed it to the lung and the same for the spleen and stomach. So again, this is just me being creative on how I could use ion pumping cords based on um, imbalances in the element channel. A question you'll probably ask me, did I use the left or did I use the right? I can't remember exactly. I, I use two sets of cords. So I, a spleen and a stomach, I used one cord and a lung and a large intestine, I used the other, I probably chose, op chose opposite sides and did accordingly based on what I was feeling under my finger. That's the best I can give you there. Okay, um, there is another way that ion pumping cords are used within AccuGraph and it's called the kidney, well, not in AccuGraph, in general, um, that Mikishima used ion pumping cords for, um, he called it the kidney return protocol. I use this protocol when I have a patient that has a really, really low average and I just can't get those numbers to come up, is extremely kidney deficient. They're really weak. weak. Um, they have, they've had a sickness or a disease and they just need extra energy. And it, when I was reading in um, the book that I told you about in the last webinar, The Channel Divergence, and 
the way Mikishima describes it is when there's little or no chi left to work with, the he says that the kidney channel is inherently weak. And then when the patient is really sick and that the, the kidney channel just doesn't have what it takes to give all that it needs. This allows this protocol that I'm about to show you allows you to rally up what chi is available in the kidney channel, bring it to the surface, make it more usable so that you could move on to other treatments. So here is an example of how this works. And again, this is, you can't, you wouldn't just click this within AccuGraph. Perhaps maybe it's something we should add in in the future. But it, you're using bladder 11, bladder 23, and bladder 40. So if the patient is face down, you would, um, you would clip bladder 40 first, and that is to um, bring energy up in the bladder channel. And then you're going to share it with bladder 23 and bladder 11. So you'd have black clips would be on bladder 40, and your red clips would be on bladder 23 and bladder 11. So this is similar to the theory within the video that I just showed where you had two clips on one wire. So you have both black clips on bladder 40 and, um, and then you would move it forward. I had a couple of notes I wanted to share. So I was reading in, in, Accu, in AccuGraph on the bladder 11, I was trying to figure out exactly why they chose bladder 11. Bladder 23 is the black back shoe of the kidney. And, um, but bladder 11 is the influential point of bones and the sea of blood. Um, so I, I feel like there's a lot of strength that comes from bladder 11 and that's why it is used. So there's that. Now you have a way to use your ion pumping cords to take an extremely deficient patient and strengthen them. If Mikishima said sometimes he would use this only as his root treatment, other times he would do this treatment alone for 10 minutes and then move on to his next treatment so that the next treatment could be better. So this changes the philosophy of do these points and then add all the chief complaints in. This, this is a special circumstance. If your patient couldn't lie face down and they needed to be more in the supine position, um, the points recommended by Mikishima were kidney 10, CB6, and bladder one. So notice, um, CB6 would have two clips to it and kidney 10 would have two. And then bladder one is what he talks about in the book. I'm again, still not comfortable with needling bladder one. I would do bladder two. So you're using four wires and kidney 10. Actually, I say kidney 10 will have two wires, but so will CB6. So this is how you would use it if they were front. Okay, so I want to move on and talk about a branch treatment. And I just have a couple of suggestions on how you can use ion pumping cords for unique branch treatment approaches. And one, Adrian talked about it earlier when he was talking about the science. Mikishima recognized that you could treat burn victims um, with ion pumping cords. And so this is just a little bit of information to put in your bank of knowledge if you ever had a burn patient. So what would be done is you would place aluminum foil over the burn loosely, just put the aluminum foil over the burn and you would clip the black clips to the aluminum foil and then you would use the red clip on any distant point on the channel. So if you're looking at this uh, particular patient, notice that it's the lung, the large intestine, and the San Zhao channels. So I would use three um, ion pumping cords. I'd put the wire over the hand or the aluminum foil on the hand. I'd put three black clips onto it. And then I would choose dis um, distant points from there somewhere on on the on those three channels, I would put needles in them and I would put red clips and I would leave them there. If I was doing this treatment, I wouldn't use ion pumping cords as my root treatment. I maybe would treat the ear as my root treatment and then I would do the branch treatment with the ion pumping cords. 
So maybe that will help some of you in the future. And then one other treatment that is um, sort of famous for the ion pumping cords, again, through Mikishima, is his whiplash treatment. And this has to do with the Sanjiao and um, cord or looks like I have a, a typo in my written here. So you're going to cord one and two are going to be on both sides of, so you're gonna do bladder 62 and SI3 on the left. Um, and then you would do an SI3 and a bladder 62 on the right. So then cord three, you're doing the Sanjiao, you're doing Sanjiao five and gallbladder 41 on the left. You'll want to do um, Sanjiao five and gallbladder 41 op opposite on, on the right. So you, you want to do left, right, left, right. And you're doing the gall, you're doing the Sanjiao and you're doing the, the U beach or the do. So those, that is a really good treatment for a whiplash patient. And you would use that as a branch treatment. So um, you in your handout, this is just a picture of what your handout looks like over to the left. And it kind of takes you through a step-by-step -step process. This webinar has been, um, a two part series. So we've tried really hard to make sure that you have all the links to the emails that we've posted and a way to get the ion pumping cords if you're wanting to add them into your treatment and walk you through the process. It's our first, the first webinar that we've done as an advanced theory approach. And we're hoping that you got a lot out of it. We enjoyed doing it. And I'm gonna just peek over and see if there's any questions. Let's see. So do you use blue and red lasers on bladder two and stomach two so close of the eyes? It, you can, you would have the patient with their eyes closed and you can use the blue and laser close to the eyes. The whole purpose is to make sure the patient's eyes are closed. You would never shine it into the eye, but you can use points around the eyes. Um, on, on that laser thing, I would just add this. You can, if you're going to treat a point near the eye, close the eye and then place a couple of fingers over the patient's eye so that you're blocking light, making sure the eye stays closed, and then place the laser on the point. And uh, that, that's kind of just an extra, extra precaution and protection for them. All right, so somebody asked if I would go back to the whiplash slide, which is filled with typos. I'm sorry about that, you guys. And did you have a, Catherine, did you have a specific question about the whiplash slide? I don't see any more questions. So I do apologize for the whiplash. You you want to you want to do both sides of the body. So you do Sanjiao 5, gallbladder 41 on the left with the black and the red. And then again with the black and red, same, same order, Sanjiao 5, black, red, gallbladder 41. Um, but then you would do, do it again on the right. So that is it for ion pumping cords. I hope that you feel like you know what you're doing with them or at least feel confident enough to get started and they're, it's life changing in your clinic. You'll find those patients that you just couldn't get to a new level. You'll be able to take them to a whole new level and your patients will be fascinated. Excellent. Uh, I see a couple more questions coming in, and I just want to reiterate that today's webinar is part two. So Kimberly just started right in, assuming that you already had had part one and understood the information there. Go back and review part one if you uh, need to so that you get the background that you need. And then, um, Kimberly, there's that question from Robin about blue and red lasers. So um, would I treat them both at the same time? If it felt really comfortable for me to stand and yeah, I think I would. I think I would treat them both at the same time. I would too, it's more time efficient. Red on one point, blue on the other, 15 seconds or so, and then move on to the next pair. Yep, 15, 20, I might go a little bit longer just to, uh, yeah, I guess it's all about what you feel, but 15 to 20 seconds would be the minimum. 
And somebody else asked if I could go back and talk about the typos again. I don't have time right now, but the webinar is going to be available for you um, to rewatch again later. So I've gone over time and I think we'll need to end it for now. Okay. Hey, Kimberly, great job. No stress on the overtime. It was five minutes well spent. Okay. Uh, thanks for all this great information. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and we will see you next time. All righty. Bye-bye.